<clears throat> All right. Are you ready? We're going to look at replacement theology and the feast of Yom Kippur. And what is Yom Kippur all about? What is Yom Kippur about? Who said atonement? Okay. Why then did Jesus die on Passover and not Yom Kippur? Why did the Lord die on Passover and not on Yom Kippur? I see that hand. Is there another? Yes. Score! You get the prize. Okay. Passover refers to individual salvation. Yom Kippur refers to national salvation of Israel only. Only. That's what it refers to. If you remember the parable of the sheep and the goats all appear before God and he separates the sheep from the goats. Those are not individuals. Go back and read it. It's nations. He's separating the sheep nations from the goat nations. Which nations supported Israel and which ones don't. That is the separation of the nations. On Yom Kippur, Israel would make atonement for themselves. So five days later, the Feast of Tabernacles is about atonement for the nations, the rest of the world. So in one sense, Yom Kippur is the national atonement only for Israel. And I can prove that. It's in your Bible. And then when they made atonement for themselves, like the high priest has to make atonement for himself and his family before he makes atonement for the nation of Israel. Israel, as the head, has to make atonement for themselves as a high priest nation, they in turn then on tabernacles make atonement for the 70 nations of the world, which is why they would kill 70 bulls. They kill a bull on Yom Kippur for themselves and 70 bulls for the 70 nations mentioned in Genesis. Okay, does everybody got it? Okay, so that's what that's about. Now, what has replacement theology done? As we know, it's turned Yeshua from this and to this, ah! Well, here's the thing. What I want to do is compare the book of Leviticus to the book of Revelation. Everything is a dress rehearsal. In the book of Revelation, do you hear anything about trumpets? The seven trumpets? It's tied to the Feast of Trumpets. And then you're going to see Yom Kippur now in the book of Revelation. And then the next week I'll talk about the Feast of Tabernacles, where God tabernacles among us in the book of Revelation. It's all tied together. How many of you know that as far as replacement theology goes, they've replaced the priesthood? Look at this. Here are... You'll see these people in colorful clothes. These are their clothes they wear at home. They're the priests, and they're coming, and they're bringing down the stairs a stack of the priestly garments. They have to take their clothes off from home, and they have to put on the white clothes for the priestly garments. Now, here you have different types of priestly garments. The high priest would typically look like that, except on Yom Kippur. But all the priests would be clothed in white linen. And what is white linen representative of? The righteousness of the saints. That's what it says in the book of Revelation. But the Catholics, when they took over the priesthood, instead of all white, they decided to wear all black. Interesting. They're replacing it. But they have their colorful clothes, too, that they like to wear. Okay. All kinds. So the priestly garments have been replaced. But let's go back. Get rid of that one. <laughs> to the priestly garments. Look at Exodus 28.4. These are the garments which they shall make. A breastplate, an ephod, a robe, a broad coat, mitre, girdle, and they shall make holy garments for Aaron your brother and his sons that they may minister unto me in the priest's office. But look what happens on Yom Kippur in Leviticus 16, 4. 
Now he has to put on a holy linen coat, linen breeches, linen girdle, linen miter. He shall be attired. These are holy garments. Therefore shall he wash his flesh in water and put them on. So on Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, they would have to take this off and put this on. Again, white represents the righteousness of the saints. And this is why every Yom Kippur, everyone dresses in white. And why here on Yom Kippur, everyone comes wearing something in white. Because white represents the righteousness of the saints. Okay, now, look at Leviticus 16, 8 through 11. This is the Yom Kippur service. And Aaron is to cast lots upon how many goats? Two goats. One lot is for the Lord. The other lot is for the scapegoat. Aaron brings the goat upon which the Lord's lot fell and offers him for a sin offering. But the goat on which the lot fell to be the scapegoat shall be presented alive before the Lord to make an atonement with him and to let him go for a scapegoat into the wilderness. And Aaron will bring the bull of the sin offering, which is for who? Himself. Not for anybody else. And he makes an atonement for himself and for his house. And he kills the bull of the sin offering, which is for who? Himself. Okay. Now, so look, I'll follow along in these slides now. So here we are. It's early in the morning. Yom Kippur. And they're all getting ready for the morning offerings. And we see the high priest, he brings out these two lots, one for the Lord and one becomes the scapegoat. And here he is. He's holding up the lot for the Lord. This is kind of what it looks like. It says to Adonai, La Adonai, Yud Heh And so one of those goats has a red sash tied around his horn and he is led out into the wilderness, but the other one is sacrificed. So off they go with the scapegoat, and they take him east, like toward China. Okay, they're going that direction, and they're taking him through the wilderness, over the Mount of Olives, down, going down to the Judean wilderness. And they were, you know, to take the scapegoat out there. But a problem started occurring. The scapegoat that had all their sins will go to a neighboring town. And they go, we don't want your sins. And they don't want the sins coming back. So they decided the solution was to throw it over a cliff. So that's what they did. And they said that there was the red sash that was tied around one of the little horns, antlers, whatever you want. Well, guess what? They also put a red sash, I don't know if you can see it, on the door of the altar. Now, those doors are not normal doors. Those doors were seven stories high, 75 feet, 25 feet wide. It took like 20 men to open these doors. They were so big, all right? But what happened, and this literally is what happened for many Yom Kippur's, when the goat had gone over the cliff and died, the red sash would immediately turn white. And that's how they knew their sins were forgiven. Now, then what does the high priest do? He takes the bull of the sin offering, which is for himself, and he kills the bull. And then what do we find happens next? Let's look at Leviticus 16, 12 through 15. Then it says he's to take a censer full of burning coals of fire from off the altar. Okay, what does he do? He takes a censer of burning coals from fire off the altar, the brazen altar that's out there. In this case, it was a big altar. And then he has to go before the Lord, right? I want to put this in your mind. Censer full of burning coals of fire from off the altar. Put that in your head. This is what he has to do. And his hands are full of sweet incense, beaten small and brought within the veil. And then he puts... He's got fire in one hand, incense in the other hand, and he puts them together, which causes all kinds of smoke. 
Okay, he puts the incense upon the fire before the Lord that the cloud of the incense covers the mercy seat that's upon the ark. So he does not die. And then he takes the blood of the bull and he sprinkles it with his finger on the mercy seat eastward. And before the mercy seat, he's to sprinkle of the blood with his finger how many times? Hmm. And we have seven plagues in the book of Revelation. And then it says, he kills the goat of the sin offering next. That is for the people. And he brings his blood within the veil and does with that blood as he did with the blood of the bull. And he sprinkles upon the mercy seat and before the mercy seat. So here we go. He now has the incense and the burning coals. And he goes in before the Lord and he puts it on the mercy seat and so then the smoke ascends and then he has to sprinkle the blood seven times now if you remember everything that was done in the tabernacle or the temple on earth was a pattern of what is going on where in heaven we're not the real we're the copy we are the shadow what's going on what's really going on up there now, here's one thing we do know from Psalm 141, verse 2. It says, let my prayer be set before you as what? Incense. And the lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. So the incense on earth is also representative of the prayers that are going on. Okay? So, let me see. Leviticus 16, 2. And the Lord said to Moses, speak to Aaron, your brother, that he doesn't come at all times into the holy place within the veil before the mercy seat, which is on the ark, so he doesn't die. And I'm going to appear in the cloud upon the mercy seat. Okay, so how often can they go in before the mercy seat? Once a year. That's the only time the ark is seen is once a year. And then God appears in the cloud. Well, the cloud is the prayers of the saints. Now, verse 34, Leviticus 16. This is to be a temporary statute. Oh, no, no. An everlasting statute to make atonement for who? It doesn't say for all the nations. It's only for the children of Israel, for all of their sins. And it's only done how often? Once a year. Well, now look at Revelation 6, 9. He opened the fifth seal, and I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God, for the testimony which they held, and they're crying with a loud voice, How long, O Lord, holy and true, do you not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? Okay. Yom Kippur is the day of judgment. This is why they're crying out on this day. Yom Teruah, the court is in session. Yom Kippur, judgment is meted out. The court is over. Okay? Now, so this is not referring just to Christians. This is mostly a verse from Leviticus where they're saying the same thing. Now, look at Revelation 8, 3 through 6. Take a look at this picture here first. Here we go. What's going on earth is happening in heaven. Look at this. Another angel comes and stands at the altar, having a golden censer. There was given him much incense that he should offer it with the prayers of all the saints upon the golden altar which was before the throne. And the smoke of the incense which came with the prayers of the saints ascended up before God out of the angel's hand. Look at this. The angel took the censer, filled it with fire of the altar, and cast it into the earth. That's exactly what the high priest does. This is a high priest in heaven who is going through the Yom Kippur service. And it says there were voices and thunderings and lightnings and an earthquake. And the seven angels which had the seven trumpets prepared the souls to sound. Can you imagine? Look at Revelation 11, 15 through 19. They go through the seven angels. The seventh angel sounds. 
There were great voices in heaven saying, the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Messiah, and he shall reign forever and ever and ever. And the 24 elders which were sitting before God on their seats all fell on their faces. They worship God and they say, we give thanks, O Lord God Almighty, which art and wast and art to come because you've taken to yourself your great power and you have reigned. And the nations, they were angry, and your wrath has come, and the time of the dead, that they would be judged, and that you should give a reward to your servants, the prophets, to the saints, and to them that fear your name, small and great, and should destroy those who are destroying the earth. And look at this. The temple of God was opened in heaven, and there was seen in his temple the ark of his testament, and there was lightning and voices and thunder and an earthquake and great hail. You know what that's telling you? This event happens on Yom Kippur. This is a Yom Kippur event, and the clouds, and there's lightning. And there's thunder. And the ark is seen in heaven. Can you imagine? I just wanted to make a point. Anybody sleep when you woke up? Okay. Leviticus 16, 16 and 17. He's making atonement for the holy place because of the uncleanness of the children of Israel. Because of their transgression and all their sins. And he shall do for the tabernacle of the congregation that remains among them in the midst of their uncleanness. Now look at this. Here we're in Leviticus. Note, we're in Leviticus. There shall no man be in the tabernacle of the congregation when he goes in to make atonement in the holy place until he comes out, having made atonement for himself, for his house, and for all the congregation of Israel. Yom Kippur is only for the nation of Israel. So that's Leviticus, right? How many people are to be in the tabernacle when he makes atonement? Well, let's jump to Revelation. We just saw it was during the Yom Kippur. The temple is filled with the smoke from the glory of God and from his power. And no man was able to enter in the temple until the seven plagues of the seven angels were fulfilled. Again, it's a pattern of what's going on in heaven. This is why we know if you don't believe in replacement theology and you connect the dots, you see this event is going to happen on Yom Kippur. Not any other day in history, ever. If you're on God's calendar, which is why I'm promoting the calendar... I want you to be aware of the times and seasons. That doesn't mean six o'clock or winter. You have to know the calendar. This is why we do this. It's not for us. It's because we want God's glory to be seen. Look at Genesis 45 verse 1. It all goes back to Joseph. There stood no man with Joseph while Joseph made himself known to his brothers. Did you know that happened on Yom Kippur? And I can prove it. First off, let me say this. Yom Kippur was also known as the only day the high priest would speak to God face to face. Only once a year could he go into the Holy of Holies. There's the ark. God's there, and he would speak to God face to face. Look at Ezekiel chapter 20, verse 33 through 35. As I live, says the Lord God, surely with a mighty hand, with an outstretched arm, and with fury poured out, I will rule over you, and I will bring you out from the people. I will gather you out of the countries wherein you are scattered with a mighty hand, with a stretched out arm, and with fury poured out. And what am I going to do? I'm going to bring you into the wilderness of the people, and there I will plead with you face to face. This event will happen on Yom Kippur. He's going to speak to them. Yom Kippur is the very day the veil will be moved from Israel's eyes, and they'll know Yeshua is their Messiah. That is the event that Yom Kippur prophetically speaks of, just like with Joseph. It was on that day the veil was removed, and he saw he was Joseph. That happened on Yom Kippur. And that's today Israel's going to recognize Yeshua as their Messiah on that day. Look at this. 
Genesis 45, verse 6. Joseph is speaking to his brothers, saying, go get dad and bring him back here. He says, for these two years has the famine been in the land. And yet there are how many more years? Because two plus five is seven. Okay. Now, follow this. Let me see. i got so many good things. Okay, first, I want to go here. Then we're going to come back. Let me make sure. Mm -hmm. Cancel. Okay. Isaiah 25, verse 7 and 8. God is going to destroy in this mountain the face of the covering that is cast over who? All people. The veil that is spread over all nations. He will swallow up death in victory, and the Lord God will wipe away all tears from all, off all faces, and the rebuke of his people is going to take away from off all the earth, for the Lord has spoken it. There's a veil that is over the Jewish people, but there's also a veil over all the nations, and the veil being removed speaks of Yom Kippur. Most of the church today, due to replacement theology, has a veil over their face concerning the eternal plan that God still has for the Jewish people. The veil consists of two parts. The inability to recognize God's purpose for the Jews. They think God is done with Israel. It's done with the Jews. It's all about us. The other one is an inability inability to understand the church's role for the removing of the veil. God will remove the veil from both groups. The Christians will realize Jesus was Jewish. And the Jews will realize Jesus was Jewish. But he's waiting for something significant to happen first. Let's look at Zechariah 12.10. God says, I'm going to pour upon the house of David, the tribe of Judah, and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the spirit of grace and supplications, and they shall look upon me whom they have pierced. And they will mourn for him as one mourns for his only son and be in bitterness as one that is bitterness for his firstborn, as God is in bitterness because of the death of his firstborn. This is where John 19, 37, again, the scripture says, they will look on him whom they have pierced. This is referring back to Zechariah. Now look at Revelation 19, verse 2 through 13. Or verse 2, and then verse 13 through 15. It says, for true and righteous are his judgments. For he's judged the great whore which corrupted the earth with her fornication. He's avenged the blood of his servants. Remember, the big cry was, when are you going to avenge? And here it says, he's avenged the blood of his servants. He was clothed with a vesture dip in blood. His name is called the word of God. The armies which are in heaven follow him on white horses, clothed in fine linen. All right. White and clean, out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that with it he'll smite those nations, he'll rule them with a rod of iron, and he treads what? The winepress of the fiercest and wrath of Almighty God. Okay, where it says true and righteous are his judgments and revelation, do you know what they're quoting? The Song of Moses. Look here, Deuteronomy 32 verse 4. He is the rock. His work is perfect. All his ways are judgment. A God of truth and without iniquity, just and right is he. Okay, on Yom Kippur, what happens? Everyone wears what color? White. White. All right. It is, think of the wedding. Typically, the bride comes in what? White. And when they come on the horses, what color are the horses and their garments? Because it's a Yom Kippur event. This event will literally happen some year on Yom Kippur. That is why. And here they are singing the song of Moses, which is a Torah portion coming to a place near you. It's called Ha'azinu. 
which says, Give ear, O ye heavens and earth. And what do we hear in Revelation to all the churches? He who has an ear to hear, let them hear. And what it is, it's the song of Moses. And if you don't know the song of Moses, you won't know what to be listening to. 2 Corinthians 3, 13 through 16 says, don't, but not as in Moses' time, he even had to put a veil over his face, that the children of Israel could not steadfastly look to the end that which is abolished, but their minds or their hearts were blinded. Till this day remains the same veil untaken away in the reading of the Tanakh, which veil is done away with in Messiah. But even to this day, when Moses is read, there's a veil upon their heart. Nevertheless, when it will turn to the Lord, the veil will be taken away, which is what happens on Yom Kippur. It'll happen that day. Israel has yet to enter into their prophetic holy calling. Now, Revelation 1-7, he's coming with the clouds. Every eye will see him, and they who pierced him. All the kiddos of the earth will well because of him, even so, Amen. So again, this is going to be happening on Yom Kippur. Now, let's go back to Joseph. Genesis 41, verse 1. Joseph had given the dream of the butler and the baker. One of them died, and one of them got to go serve Pharaoh. Okay? And then it says, it came to pass at the end of two full years, Pharaoh dreamed, and behold, he stood by the river. You know what it means when it says two full years? It means from Rosh Hashanah to Rosh Hashanah. So Pharaoh is having his dream on Rosh Hashanah, which means Joseph interpreted the dreams at Rosh Hashanah or the Feast of Trumpets. Two full years, Rosh Hashanah to Rosh Hashanah go by. All right? And then what happens later we have the seven years of plenty, and then, which is Rosh Hashanah to Rosh Hashanah. Seven, it's a Shemitah cycle. And then the next Shemitah cycle, which is of the famine, which starts on Yom Kippur, his brothers realize he's the Messiah, and it says these two years has the famine been in the land, and yet there are still five years in which there will be neither earring nor harvest. Okay. That's Rosh Hashanah to Rosh Hashanah. The two years go by. And then, of course, 10 days later is Yom Kippur. He puts them in hold. And then what happens? The veil is removed when Judah repents and they realize he's the Messiah on Yom Kippur. All of this is tied right back to the scriptures. And then it says in Genesis 42, 8, prior to that, Joseph knew his brethren, but they didn't know him. All right? And that's what it says in John 1. He came unto his own, but his own received him not because they didn't recognize him. Okay, so what is the main reason that Joseph's brothers didn't recognize him? Look at the picture. Why did Joseph's brothers not recognize him? He looked Egyptian. He spoke Egyptian. He had an interpreter. He looked, he smelled, was dressed. Well, guess what? Here is how the church has been presenting Jesus for the last 2,000 years. And they wonder why they can't recognize him. The church is responsible to remove that veil and let them know Yeshua loves Torah. It's not done away with. Yeshua keeps the feast. They're not done away with. Yeshua follows Torah. Yeshua keeps the Sabbath. The church always sends these missionaries to Israel and they do much more harm than good because that's who they're presenting. That's the problem. Okay, this is what replacement theology does. This is why it has to be abandoned. Yeshua is seen as some white, blonde European, far from his own roots. How is offering a pagan Jesus good news to the Jew? Now, I'm going to jump ahead to next week. Next week is Sukkot. Okay? Rosh Hashanah is the wedding. 
Sukkot is the wedding supper. Okay? They say uh, uh, the Jewish wedding typically, typically is seven days long. And if you remember, in Ezekiel, a day for a year. And so you have seven years for the wedding, and at the end is the wedding supper. So watch. Look at Luke. This is going to be hard for some Christians. But Luke 12, verse 35 through 37. Let your loins be girded about and your lights burning and be like men who wait for the Lord when he returns from the wedding. What? There's going to be believers who don't make it to the wedding. They get to make it to the wedding supper. They get to make the wedding supper. That's seven years later or seven days later. But they don't get to go to the wedding. It says, so that when he comes and he knocks, they may open it to him when? Immediately. He came and knocked the first time for the wedding, but no one responded like in the Song of Songs. And so they went out and looked and he was gone. It says, blessed are those servants whom the Lord when he comes finds watching. Verily I say to you, he shall then gird himself, make them to sit down to food, and he will come forth and serve them. At the wedding supper, the Messiah will be serving all of us. That make it to the wedding supper. Now look at Matthew 8, 11, and 12. I say to you that many will come from the east and the west, and they're going to sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven, but the children of the kingdom is going to be cast into outer darkness where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. That's referring to the tribulation. There are children of the kingdom of God that are going to go through the tribulation and get to make the wedding supper, but they don't make the wedding. This comes from Zephaniah. Look at Zephaniah 1, 7 and 8. Hold your peace at the presence of the Lord your God, for the day of the Lord is at hand. The Lord has prepared a sacrifice. He's bid his guests, and it'll come to pass in that day of the Lord's sacrifice. I will punish who? The princes, the king's children, all those who are clothed with strange apparel. The strange apparel refers to our own righteousness. We have our own tux on, our own three-piece suit on. We're coming in our own works, our own righteousness, not in the garment that the king gave you. We're trying to come in our own righteousness. Look at Zephaniah 1.14, a few verses after that. The great day of the Lord God is near. It's near. It hastes greatly. Even the voice of the day of the Lord, the mighty men will cry bitterly. So Zephaniah 1 speaks of that day. Now, here's, look at this, Matthew 22, 1 through 5, and 8 through 11. Jesus answered and spoke to them again by a parable, saying, the kingdom of heaven is like a king, which made a marriage for his son. Hmm, that sounds like the father who's making a marriage for his son, a wedding. And he sends forth his servants to call them that were bidden. Again, that's the personal invitation I was talking about at the beginning of the service. Everyone is given a personal invitation. But they wouldn't come. Again, he sent forth other servants, saying, Tell them which are bidden. That's the believers. Behold, I prepared my dinner, my ox and my fatlings are killed. Everything's ready. Come to the marriage. But they made light of it and went their way. One to his farm, to his merchandise. Then he said to his servants, The wedding is ready, but they which were bidden were not worthy. So go into the highways as many as you find, bid to the marriage. So those servants went to the highways, gathered together all, as many as they found, both what? bad and good. We're not to judge. We're just to catch the fish and bring it in and let him separate them. The problem with so many Christians in churches, they try to separate the people. We're to just bring them all in. Who cares? And the wedding was furnished with guests. But when the king came in to see the guests, he saw a man who had on strange clothing. He didn't have on the wedding garment that the king provided. He came in his own fine clothes. Wedding garment. Look at Luke 14, 16 through 24. He said, a certain man made a great supper and bid many. He sent his servant at supper time to tell them which were bidden to come. Everything's ready. And they all, with one consent, began to make excuse. The first one said, I bought a piece of ground. I have to go check it out. I pray, let me be excused. Another said, I bought five 
oxen. I got to prove them. Please, let me be excused. And others said, I married a wife and I can't come. So that servant came and showed his Lord these things. And then the master of the house, being angry, said to his servant, go out quickly into the streets, the lanes of the city, and bring in here the poor, the maimed, the halt, the blind. And the servant said, Lord, it is done as you have commanded. And yet there's still room. And the Lord said to his servant, go out into the highways and hedges, compel them to come in that my house may be full. I tell you, none of those men which are bidden will taste of my supper. There's going to be a separation. Some people won't even make it to the wedding supper. Now in Ezekiel 4, 6, when they had accomplished them, he says, lie again on your right side. You'll bear the iniquity of the house of Judah 40 days. I appointed you a day for a year. Okay. So the tribulation is seven years, or you could say the seven days of the Jewish wedding. How do you want to make it to the wedding supper? Not just the wedding. I want to make it, I want to make it to the wedding supper, but I also want to make it to the wedding. Well, guess what? Everyone is invited to the supper of the great God. All right? Revelation 19.9, blessed are they which are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And look at the other side. A loud voice saying to all the fowls that fly in the midst of heaven, come and gather yourselves together unto the supper of the great God. The choice is, which supper do you want to be at? You can make a choice. You can be at the supper of the Lamb or the supper of the vultures. It's your choice. And I think one of the the big problems that Christians have not being on God's calendar is they think, how many of you know God declared the end from the beginning? Well, they think linearly, okay, you got the beginning and the end is so far away. No, everything is circular and the beginning and the end are connected. He can tell you the end from the beginning because they're next to each other. No, they're not miles away. And we're about to end Deuteronomy and circle back to Genesis, and it's connected. Life is cyclical. It's not linear. And so all of our patterns get mixed up. Uh, So with that said, let's stand.